Good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, may I first thank my friend, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Jaffna, Professor Sri Satun Raja, for that very kind and extensive introduction. I don't know whether I deserve all that. Vice Chancellor of the University of Jaffna, Professor Sri Satkun Raja, beloved wife of late Dr. Ganesh Ratnam, Mrs. Nirmala Ganesh Ratnam, members of the family, respected members of the Council of the University of Jaffna, past Vice Chancellors of the University, respected Deans, professors, head of the departments, other academic and non-academic staff members, and also the registrar and the birth of the university, and other distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I feel deeply honored to be invited to deliver the first Malvaganam Ganesh Ratnam Memorial Oration organized by the University of Jaffna in this historic city. To me, Ganesh was a very sincere, trusted, professional friend. He served as a senior surgeon in the Council of the, the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka during my tenure of office, and I served as a past president in the council headed by Dr. Ganesh Ratham as a president. Dr. Ganesh Ratham was a highly respected surgeon. With his inborn confidence and with his high technical competence, he could handle any difficult or any challenging surgical situation, be it in elective or in emergency surgery. I can bow to that. Dr. Ganesh Ratham single-handedly, as you heard already, served the people of the Northern Peninsula for well over two decades at a most difficult time in the modern history of Jaffna. Subsequently, he served as a senior consultant surgeon at the National Hospital Colombo till his retirement. He was a shining light to thousands of critically injured and ill patients during these exceptionally difficult times when they had absolutely no chance of obtaining any emergency or elective services anywhere else in the island. While handling this massive workload in the hospital, he also, as we already heard, functioned as the head of the Department of Surgery of the University of Jaffna, performing all teaching and training activities of thousands of undergraduates and postgraduates, many postgraduate surgical trainings, protecting and guiding them at a time when education and training in surgery was not simply available to northern students. Considering his seniority at the time, he was eligible to the post of the consultant surgeon to Colombo National Hospital, as it was called then, a position many surgeons of his vintage would aspire to. But Ganesh never left Jaffna at the time to serve his people. Students who learn from this exceptionally gifted surgeon are serving in very high prestigious positions locally and globally, and I can see some of them here. It's a testimony to his dedication, enthusiasm, and unparalleled commitment to work. Dr. Ganesh Ratnam was a family man, deeply loved and strongly supported by his wife, Nirmala, who's here, and four loving children, Nishanti, Ramana, Pavitra, and Ranga. And when he left peacefully on the 2nd of October 2017, he would have been in innate peace with himself. Considering the number of lives he has served during his lifetime and his massive contribution to the suffering of mankind. Unlike many of us who were serving in the rest of the island at the time, Dr. Ganesh Ratnam had to perform services in a very difficult terrain and under tremendous pressure. 
and he has mentioned this to me at times, despite this. He managed to get most things right, and he did not fail. In dedication to the memory of this exceptionally humane surgical giant of our time, who dedicated his services to his people at the time of their need, I'm extremely pleased and very deeply honored to deliver the first memorial lecture organized by the University of Jaffna to his memory on a very simple topic. And that is, why do we fail? Or put it differently, how to get things right? So this is title or topic is not only for medical profession, but to all of us. Let's begin. What I'm going to say now is scientifically validated and evidence-based. I'll start the story now. In 1970s, there were two German philosophers, Samuel Gorowitz and Alcedia McIntyre. They wrote a short essay in 1970s on the subject of human fallibility. Now, fallibility is, means failure to achieve or incompleteness. What they were trying to find out was why we fail on what we set out to do in the world. One reason they identified was what they called the necessary fallibility, which means that some things we want to do are things well beyond our capacity, and it's simply not possible, and that's necessary fallibility. For instance, one may have an exceptional physical ability like Muhammad Ali in boxing, or one may have a state-of-art cutting a technology technology like landing a spacecraft on Mars. But still there is a limitation to what we can do beyond which we cannot achieve. And this is what is called the necessary fallibility. For example, Muhammad Ali can't fight with an elephant. That's not possible. Although we can go to Mars and come back, we can't go to another galaxy and come back today. So these are things which are not simply possible and that is called the necessary fallibility. However, there are things within our reach today which we could not achieve in the past. For example, like treating a heart attack before the heart muscle gets permanently damaged. Now in a heart attack, I think most of you already know that what actually happens is that a blood clot will come and block an artery which is supplying the heart. And that part of the heart which is supplied by this this particular blood vessel is going to run short of blood supply. And as medical students know that, there is a pathological process. And unless you remove this block, either by giving a medicine or by putting a stent, within 45 minutes or so, that part of the heart is going to be permanently damaged. When I was an intern medical student, intern medical officer or medical student, I did not have the knowledge or skill to unblock a block. But today, you have the knowledge and you have the skill to unblock a block. Now that's in medicine. We go into a different field and look at the engineering. Now today, we can see skyscrapers, big buildings. They will say 72 or 72nd or 78th floor, you have to go. They are massive skyscrapers. We can now transplant hearts, which would have been unimaginable years ago. Latest, of course, is scientists are now developing a technique called gene editing. From this technology, soon we should be able to grow human organs like kidneys, which are in high demand for purpose of transplantation. They are in short supply always. Inside pigs, because pigs have a similar type of their physiology. So these are some of the things within our control today are going to be within our control in the foreseeable future, which we could not do it before. However, when we try to do things within our control, like what I just told you, 
things we have the capacity to do, so unlike going to galaxies, sometimes we still fail. These two philosophers found that there are two reasons why we fail at doing things that are thought to be within our control. The first reason is ignorance. In simple term, the ignorance is actually partial knowledge. That is, although we have an understanding of certain things, although we think that we know, we do not have a full understanding. We know, but not 100%. And that is because modern science has not given us entire knowledge about the, 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 the universe, entire knowledge about the human body as well. We have a lot of things to learn about the universe and about the human body. For example, going back into the heart attacks, we still do not know how to 100% prevent a heart attack. Of course, as medical doctors, we tell you, don't put on weight, don't eat fat, do regular exercises, avoid eating sugar, avoid eating salt, don't be under stress, and you are a very good patient and do all these things. Still, there is no absolute guarantee that you will not get a heart attack. In other words, our knowledge is there, but not 100%. So that is because we have a partial knowledge, partial knowledge about this thing, not 100%. So all this is because although we have an understanding of these things, we have only got a partial understanding of what we can do. So ignorance is one reason why we sometimes fail to do things within our capacity. But the second reason, I told you there are two reasons they said. One is ignorance. The second reason why we fail to do things, to do things of what we set out to do is due to inaptitude. Now, from now onwards, I'm going to tell you, for, especially for the students, and this is the title of my speech from now onwards. Inaptitude. If you have not heard this word, remember it. Inaptitude. So what does inaptitude mean? What it means is that we have the full knowledge. We have all the skills, not partial, full. But there are instances or situations we fail to apply them correctly. And as a result, we fail. We have the full knowledge. We have the full skills. We have a full understanding of the outcomes. But there are still instances or situations where we do not apply this, and we fail. And that is inaptitude. For example, we take a recent example. Now, there was a building, five-story building in, Jaff in, in Kandy two weeks ago. It just collapsed on top of another house, killing the husband, wife, and a little child, and the wife was pregnant. That means four people. So the engineers would have constructed, or the people who constructed, would have actually missed one of the basic safety points. But the outcome was a disaster, losing lives. You don't have to be a medic for that. So that can happen, because if, you're, if you have inaptitude. Now let's take the heart attack again. We have diagnosed heart attack. We know that unless you unblock the block within 45 minutes or so, there is a possibility that that part of the heart is going to be permanently damaged unless the patient dies due to arrest or something. But with knowledge, with all the skills, still we did not achieve that task by giving streptokinase or the new drugs or a stent. Within that period of time, by the time we did it, that part of the heart has already undergone permanent damage. So therefore, the impact of the outcome of these two instances, collapse in building or permanent damage to the heart, would have been avoided if we did our job with a focused mind and as accurately as possible. So in these two instances, we fail to achieve the best outcome because of our inaptitude. What, a, what about the impact of such outcomes. 
Well, the impact of a poor outcome will depend on the environment in which this happened. If you work in high-risk environments, outcome is more serious. So what are these high-risk environments? We as surgeons work in high-risk environments all the time, and they operate in theater is a high-risk environment. Intensive care unit is a high-risk environment. Working in very infectious environments like, for example, in COVID outbreak, the, high, the first responders, and also in the past during Ebola outbreak, they were high-risk environments. Of course, not necessarily in medicine. Cockpit is a high, high risk environment, not only to the passengers, but to the pilot himself. When the plane crashes, everyone dies, including the pilot. When I do a mistake, my patient dies, but I don't die. So there is a big difference between a pilot and a surgeon. So nuclear installation. If you take construction sites, a big construction sites. So these are, in a different context, are all high risk environments. But as we develop our experience and expertise in our own professions, not necessarily in medicine, in every profession, we get better at doing things. There is a saying called practice makes perfect. So in our day-to-day -day professional life, because we are good at doing things, and because of our experience, we sometimes start doing things by reflex. But we get away. We get away because of our experience. That is most of the time, but not always. The point I'm trying to re-emphasize is, irrespective of the experience and the expertise, there's always a possibility that we may fail because of our inaptitude, because we rely too much on our experiences without sticking to basic essentials. In simple terms, we sometimes take shortcuts. I will tell you a very interesting story. In 1935, the American army, considered then as the best in the world, wanted to get better. This happened in 1935. To achieve their supremacy, they requested their two big aircraft manufacturers, Martin and Douglas, and the Boeing Company, to produce a long-range bomber with certain very challenging specifications. The speed, the distance it can fly, the weight of the bombs it can carry, etc., etc., in one sortie. So Boeing Company responded and produced the aircraft that can fly faster, twice the distance, with the capacity to carry five times the weight compared with the specifications. So as such, there was no competition between Boeing Company and Douglas and Martin. American newspapers gave a massive publicity to this aircraft. They used to call this aircraft a flying fortress, model 299. The Army placed an order for 65 of these aircraft. So the date of the competition was a mere formality. Because there is simply no comparison between the Douglas and M. Martin production and the Boeing Company production. Chief pilot was Major Hill, one of the most experienced pilots in the American Army at the time. And he was a chief pilot trainer for American Army at the time, very experienced guy. So the plane lifted off smoothly, went up to 3,000 feet, turned on one wing, and crashed. And the two of the five crew members, including the pilot, died. After this incident, the Army decided to give the contract to Douglas and Martin. And it is said that Boeing Company almost nearly went bankrupt as a result of this. So obviously an investigation was held to find out what happened. It revealed that it was not due to a technical error at fault at all, but due to a pilot error. But Major Hill was their best and the most experienced pilot who had thousands of flying miles to his credit. How can he go back? But of course, this particular aircraft, substantially more complex than all the other aircraft, the 
the Meiji Hill used to fly, the technology was a little bit more complex than what he used to do. But Meiji Hill was such an experienced pilot, he used to fly by reflex because he was, it was easy, for, you know, flying was for nothing for him. So while doing all this, unfortunately, in this particular situation, he forgot a very basic, but a very small step, which is to release the new locking mechanism in this particular aircraft in the rudder and the elevator control. So he couldn't control the aircraft, and the result was a disaster. One small basic point. So once the results are released, the Army decided to purchase a few more Boeing aircrafts. But now the Army was very skeptical about this because now someone has to fly this aircraft. There is a bit of a doubt about the quality of this. So the group of test pilots were summoned and they were asked to discuss and give an answer to one important question. And what was the question? Question was, do pilots who are going to fly this bomber need a longer training period or not? Or if long, how long? That was the question posed by the government. So we had a lot of discussion. What they decided eventually was something very interesting. Instead of advocating a longer training program, they recommended something simple. They decided to create a pilot checklist. In fact, this is the first time the checklist came into the picture. I think some of you have seen these films. Those days, taking a plane into air is very simple. You have seen these Western films, so someone comes and pushes. It's like taking a car out of a garage. And you jump in and you start and then you go. But these new aircrafts, you just can't do that. It's too complex. So you can't they recognize that you can't run these aircrafts with the memory of one person alone. But they made this checklist quite simple, almost to fit into an index card. They used to have this card system. Step-by-step -step checks. One for taking off, one for the flight, one for landing, and the last one for taxiing, that is to get the aircraft to halt. These are, of course, things which every pilot already knew. In their language, simple stuff like, there's all the doors and windows closed, you know, something like that. Simple things. But this simple checklist in hand, pilots flew model 299, a total of 1.8 million miles without an incident. The American Army ultimately ordered 13,000 of such aircrafts, which they dubbed as this present-day B-17. Present-day B-17 was that model 299. And this was one of the main reasons why they had a distinct advantage during the Second World War against the Nazi Germany. But what about my specialty medicine? Is medicine too complex, or how complex is medicine? The ninth edition of the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases used to classify and recognize more than 13,000 diseases and different diseases. They have classified 13,000 injury types following major trauma in a critically injured patient. Different types, different combinations. So they are quite numbers. Today, we have more than 13,000 drugs. Actually, the latest evidence is we have got more than 15,000 drugs today. We have the capacity to perform around 6,000 medical and surgical invasive procedures. All these procedures have different requirements, need different skill sets. Also, there are different risks inherent to all these procedures. As surgeons, we make decisions every day whether to carry out an operation or refrain from doing it. Every patient, every day we make this decision. We balance the risks inherent to the procedure on one side of the balance, and the benefits of the operation on the other side 
or the risk of non-operation or serious. All these procedures have different requirements, need different skill sets. Also, there are different risks inherent to all these procedures. As surgeons, we make decisions every day. Whether to carry out an operation or refrain from doing it. Every patient, every day, we make this decision. We balance the risks inherent to the procedure on one side is balance, and the benefits of the operation on the other side, or the risk of non-operation also on the other side. So it's a bit of a complex situation. Every patient subconsciously, every surgeon does it. So it is definitely more complex than flying, taking off, tax, landing and taxing. Because there are a lot of things to get it right. If you cannot get it right, the most disastrous outcome, I used to talk about the outcomes, most disastrous outcome in medicine, in surgery in particular, is death, or including medicine. To highlight the magnitude of this complexity, I will tell you about interesting research study done by Israeli scientists. This particular study involved engineers observing the care of intensive care unit patients over 24-hour periods. So, they used to put an engineer to look out to the intensive care patient, to observe what is going on in, in one patient over 24 hours. They found that on an average, one ICU patient required 178 individual actions per day. Say like administering a drug, changing the IV drip, or to change the rate of ventilation, sucking the lung, etc., etc., more than 100, up to 178 actions. Every action, if not done properly, of course has a risk to the patient. They also recorded in this study the errors that are found on the observation. And they found that on average, there were two errors per day per patient. We all know that the intensive care unit succeeds when the ch chance of causing harm is kept to a minimum. So this is quite good, actually, considering the number of actions they have taken. So how can we perform such actions or decisions more effectively? Would the checklist approach work? Is it too complex? It was difficult to imagine, isn't it? Medicine, whether it's medicine is too complex for checklists, because there are so many variables. So much so that some of the complications that occurred in ICU settings those days, complications, some of the complications were regarded as routine complications. That complication is going to happen, it's routine, that's it. Nothing you can do about it. And a classic one was an infection that occurs in the lines we insert to the patients. You have, when you go to the ICUs, you put these people, with patients with lines in the neck, they're called central lines. You put these lines into a big vein so that there is, the drug will go straight into the main circulation and also if you want to give nutrition, which are highly concentrated, they get diluted with this big blood flow and then that is how, that is what the advantage, to give nutrition as well as the intravenous medication. So this is usually used for very ill patients. And the data from USA at the time showed that, on average, in USA, five million lines were inserted per year. That was the time when this particular study was done. I'm going to come to that study. Average of five million central lines have been inserted in USA. And out of these, Five to 28% of such line infections, this is a routine complication, infection of the line is thought to be a routine complication, used to end up in deaths. So this routine complication kills the patient. And that was accepted all over. In 2001, there was a critical care specialist called Peter Pronovist. Now this Peter Pronovist was a specialist, but he was a different type of person. He was very skeptical of doctors. This is because of his past experience. When he was a medical student, his father died of leukemia. But he was treated for a very long time for lymphoma. So by the time doctors changed the diagnosis from lymphoma to leukemia, the period has gone, you know, he died. So he was very, very unhappy about this incident. So after that, he became a consultant. But he did not accept 
the general norms amongst the medical profession. So this routine complication business was not, didn't go well with him. So he gave a try to reduce this line infections. He, what he did was he created a checklist. It's a simple checklist, not a complicated checklist. But he made a very important difference. Now I'm happy that the hospital director is here. The difference is that he got the mandate from the hospital administrator, the director, and gave the power to the nurses to check whether the doctors are doing this right. Because he could do this because in America everything is money, so he would have shown the value of the infection risk and the number of days the patient is in the ICU, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You can easily calculate and show this. But everyone didn't take it seriously because this is like the pilot checklist. Everything we do every day, it's nothing new. For example, whether the doctor washed his hands with soap and water before the procedure. Whether he used an antiseptic to clean this area nicely. Whether he draped the patient completely like surgeons draping a patient in the operating theater. Whether he was wearing a hat, the mask, sterile mask, sterile gloves, sterile gloves and sterile dresses, uh, the dressing. Whether he did this procedure under strict antiseptic and aseptic precautions. They put a sterile dressing over the uh, area after the procedure. Of course, if you ask any surgeon or a, any consultant anesthetist, yeah, we do this all the time, isn't it? So, what was the result? In John Hopkins Hospital, where this particular research was carried out, 10-day line infection rate at the time was 11%. That is, at the end of 10 days, 11% of the lines got infected, and some of them ended up in deaths. But the results of this study really surprised the doctors as well as the administrators. When this simple checklist was rigidly executed, 10-day line infection rate came down from 11% to 0%. 11% to 0%. So here, in this study, we have identified that what was thought as a routine complication was, in fact, a preventable complication. And this study really stimulated. This is a very sentinel study, which is quoted in most of the medical literature. So this stimulated the clinicians to think further and do more research. In 1999, there's an organization in the United States called Institute of Medicine. Institute of Medicine USA also had a very sentinel study. This particular study showed, this 1999, 40,000 to 98,000 of deaths that occurred in United States hospital. They were preventable. That is, the, these patients didn't die due to a medical condition. They died due to medical errors. Obviously, the impact of this study really hit the medical profession. And the similar study done in 2013, not that ago, showed that up to 440,000 deaths in the United States occur still due to medical errors in 2013. In fact, that was a very well-known study. That is, Compared with 1999, it's 4.5 times higher than the 1999 SKX limit. There was a high-profile case where, by mistake, a wrong kidney was removed in a patient who had only one functioning kidney. That was a very high-profile case. So the medical errors today has become the third commonest cause of death in the United States of America, only, be only be behind heart attack and cancer. Unfortunately, we do not have accurate data in Sri Lanka. Of course, your guess can be as good as mine. Now, reporting to this global problem, or responding to this global problem of safe surgical care, World Health Organization in 1998 appointed a team of experts led by a guy called Dr. Atul Gwande. Atul Gwande is a general surgeon 
with a special interest in cancer surgery and trauma surgery. He has done extensive research on the subject of patient safety, written extensively, and I recommend most of you to read his books, and in fact, some of the data I have collected is from his write-ups, which I'd like to acknowledge. He's a great guy, actually. He's Indian, but he's in the States. I saw him in the television for this COVID time as well, in John Hopkins. So the, what they, they did, it was, they identified three problems in a hospital system. In, we are talking about surgical care now. Now, when you think about surgical care, who are the givers? Surgeons. So surgeon and the team. Who are the other pe key people involved? Anesthetists and the team. So surgical teams, anesthetic teams. Then the third one is we operate in the theater. So theater environment. So they looked at the surgical teams, they looked at anesthetic teams, and they looked at the essential basics in the operating theater. And their recommendation was to develop safe surgical teams, safe anesthetic teams, and to prevent surgical site infection. When you mean surgical site infection is ideal operation, and that site gets infected, and there, there are certain reasons why that site can get infected. Might be coming from the infection from inside the body or might be coming from outside. And for this purpose, to achieve this task of developing safe surgical teams, safe anesthetic teams, and to reduce the surgical site infection, they developed, like the pilots did years ago, a 19-item checklist. Now, this 19-item checklist did a, was piloted in eight hospitals. Four hospitals from developed countries and four hospitals from developing countries, and one hospital in India was selected for this. Using this checklist, they selected five very simple outcomes. That is, using the checklist, you do the operation, and then you look at five outcomes. These outcomes, again, are very simple. After the operation, did there was wound infection or not? Did the wounds got infected? Was there any other complication to this patient? Did the patient develop pneumonia? Did the patient have to be taken back to theatre? And did the patient die? Now, we did this pilot checklist at three stages. Patient is wheeled into the theatre. So before the patient undergoes, goes to sleep, checklist do, first part of the checklist is done. When the anesthetist put the patient to sleep, before the surgeon makes the incision, the second part of the checklist is done. After finishing the operation, the patient recovers and the anesthetist will give the reversal and the patient will get up. And before the patient is wheeled out of the theatre, third part. In Sri Lanka, of course, we do it in twice, but that's, that's what the recommendation is. So as I told you, the outcome measures. Was there wound infection? Was there any complication in this patient? Did the patient develop pneumonia? Did the patient have to be taken back to the theatre for reoperation for any other reason? Did this patient die? Simple five parameters. A statistically significant improvement was noted in all five measures when the checklists were introduced. Therefore, in 2008, World Health Organization's surgical safety checklist was released globally. After that, they did two very carefully conducted studies, tested this checklist again, and both confirmed that checklists can achieve significant reductions in complications and death. We introduced checklists into Sri Lankan hospitals, and I must commend Minister of Health because 2011 or 2010, and Dr. Sri we they developed this uh, surgical uh, the safety directorate, and uh, this was formally introduced by the Minister of Health to Sri Lankan hospitals in 2012. So that is the story of the checklist how this checklist approach has helped to enhance outcomes in this complex world, especially to those of us, you and me, who work in high-risk environments. The importance of checklist to get things right in what we do. 
Finally, as we all know, during the last four decades, with the advent of minimal access surgery, we did a ERCP workshop this morning in your hospital, and you could see so much of enthusiasm. These are all minimal access surgery workshops. There have been a tremendous technological development in the field of surgery. That is how the people used to operate, and this is where it's going to be today. The permission from the respective vice chancellor, I will divert from this story because this just came to my mind. You know, good old days, before the invent of anesthesia, this is very interesting. Surgery means death because there was no anesthesia. So if you operate very fast, you can save the patient. Speed matters. So there was a surgeon called uh, Robert Hilton, um, um, Robert Liston, was London. Robert Liston was, this is before the anesthesia was invented by a dental surgeon. Robert Liston was a, thought he was labeled as the fastest surgeon in, in the UK. So UK being the, London being the empire of the world, fastest surgeon in the empire like. So it was so, in you have gone to Europe, that surgeons from Europe used to come to see this Robert Liston operating. Those days we did not have an understanding about the infections also. No one understood about germs. So surgeon used a white coat, put all the knives in the things in his pocket, and after finishing the operation, he will go and hang the coat. And then uh, the next patient, he will use the same coat, same knives, no washing and all that stuff. So use it. And the coat gets dark because it gets brown and dirty. So the color of the coat tells you how experienced a surgeon is. That was the opinion those days. So in this particular case, this is recorded in the medical literature. The case is about the fastest amputation in the world. Fastest, this is recorded in the British medical literature, in surgical literature. Fastest amputation in the world. Now Robert Liston has actually done a bow knee amputation, that is cutting the leg above the knee, in three and a half minutes. That is the fastest recorded amputation in the world. Three and a half minutes. But another interesting point about this particular operation, this particular operation had a mortality of 300%. Now when you operate on a patient and the patient dies, mortality is 100%. But this particular operation had a mortality of 300%. How did this 300% come? 300% came, of course patient died of bleeding, that is 100%. Now, he had an assistant girl, the training as a surgeon who's been trained to surgery, for, to do surgery. In the rush to do this fast, he cut her finger. And she died of gas gangrene, because no one understood gas gangrene at the time. She died of gas gangrene. That is 200%. But he was so well known about his speed that the French professor of surgery has come to see this operation. So, those days, you remember the old anatomy block where we have the theaters like this and surgeon operate, and everyone sits around and watches within a close thing. So because this guy is a French professor of surgery, so he has to be treated differently, so he was asked to come very close to the table to see how his Robert Liston is doing. So he was wearing a white coat and standing very close to Liston. In the rush, he actually, his knife brushed over his coat on the brush thing, touching the testes but not cutting them. <laughs> and the poor guy had a heart attack and died there. <laughs> that is a 300%. So this is the fastest amputation in the world. With, this is a before anesthesia and surgery. This was the era of the autonomous surgeon. Every, you know, you know, you are the god, you do the operation, you, you know, something happens to the patient, hard luck, you know, surgeon did the best, that is it. That was the era of what is called the autonomous surgeon. So, when we started developing this minimal access surgery, the problem is that everyone else can see what the hell you are doing because it's in the big screen also. That made it more pressure to the surgeons. 
So the surgeons are continuously under pressure to learn new techniques. But how you when learning and adapting new techniques, like minimal access surgery, which we did this morning, it is not possible to avoid a learning curve. You have to have a learning curve when you try to learn anything new. So this balancing the learning curve without compromising the patient's safety continues to be a challenge to all of us, considering the workload we have. Of course, our patients would like us to develop our expertise, but they don't want to us to take risks with their lives. If I'm allowed to quote one of the British public report, which says that there should be no learning curve as far as the patient's safety is concerned. But on the other hand, at a time the pace of medical innovation is advancing so rapidly, surgeons have a little choice but to learn new techniques. And therefore the learning curve is extremely useful for both training and for practicing surgeons. And this is inescapable for our progress. I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, but I'm going to tell you another interesting research regarding the learning curves, and I assure you that this is my last story. This is very interesting. In 2002, a group of Harvard Business School researchers, nothing to do with medicine, who actually have made a specialty of studying learning curves in industry, like learning curves in building aeroplanes, decided to examine learning curves among surgeons. This is a very interesting study in 2002. They followed 18 cardiac surgeons as they took on a new technique then, the minimally invasive cardiac surgery, and that was the first of its kind. That's the time the minimally invasive cardiac surgery was coming into the picture. As learning is ubiquitous in medicine, no one has ever compared how well different surgeons actually do it. To make it simple to some of you, who are not, in, in the, not in the medical profession, minimally invasive cardiac surgery is uh, approaching the heart through small holes. Now, you know that when you do a heart operation, you do a divide the sternum right in the middle, open it, and used to do it. But minimally invasive cardiac surgery, there is no cut like that. You make small holes, like your laparoscopic surgery. This is thoracoscopic surgery. You put instruments, and then you can see it on the screen, and you start operating on the heart. But this type of cardiac surgery has to be performed. You have to reroute the blood from that system into another system till you operate on the heart. So you have to reroute the blood to the heart bypass machine, but because autonomous surgery. So when we started developing this minimal access surgery, the problem is that everyone else can see what the hell you're doing because it's in the big screen also. That made it more pressure to the surgeons. So the surgeons are continuously under pressure to learn new techniques. But how you when learning and adapting new techniques, like minimal access surgery, which we did this morning, it is not possible to avoid a learning curve. You have to have a learning curve when you try to learn anything new. So this balancing the learning curve without compromising the patient's safety continues to be a challenge to all of us, considering the workload we have. Of course, our patients would like us to develop our expertise, but they don't want to, us to take risks with their lives. If I'm allowed to quote one of the British public report, which says that there should be no learning curve as far as the patient's safety is concerned. But on the other hand, at a time the pace of medical innovation is advancing so rapidly, surgeons have a little choice but to learn new techniques. And therefore the learning curve is extremely useful for both training and for practicing surgeons. And this is inescapable for our progress. I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, but I'm going to tell you another interesting research regarding the learning curves, and I assure you that this is my last story. This is very interesting. In 2002, a group of Harvard Business School researchers, nothing to do with medicine, who actually have made a specialty of studying learning curves in industry, like learning curves in building aeroplanes, decided to examine learning curves among surgeons. This is a very interesting study in 2002. They followed 18 cardiac surgeons as they took on a new technique then, the minimally invasive cardiac surgery, 
And that was the first of its kind. That's the time the minimal invasive cardiac surgery was coming into the picture. As learning is ubiquitous in medicine, no one has ever compared how well different surgeons actually do it. To make it simple to some of you, who are in, in, in the med, not in the medical profession, minimally invasive cardiac surgery is uh, approaching the heart through small holes. Now, you know that when you do a heart operation, you do a divide the sternum right in the middle, open it, and used to do it. But minimally invasive cardiac surgery, there is no cut like that. You make small holes, like your laparoscopic surgery. This is thoracoscopic surgery. You put instruments, and then you can see it on the screen, and you start operating on the heart. But this type of cardiac surgery has to be performed. You have to reroute the blood from that system into another system till you operate on the heart. So you have to reroute the blood to the heart bypass machine. But because this is going through the small holes, you have to re-device or new devices, new methods to reroute blood involved in this, using the balloons and the catheters through the big vessels in the groin. And they have to, they have to learn to operate through a very minimal space, not only for surgeons, but assisting surgeons. But all, also in the others in the assisting team, the anesthetists. Anesthesiologists have a different technique now. There are perfusionists who are looking after the machines, and they have to learn different techniques because this is a different technique. So all of them have new tasks, new instruments, new roles, and new techniques to learn. They also have to witness new complications because this was not done before. And they have to find out new methods to sort out the problems also. It's a substantial learning curve when you think about it. And same thing happened when laparoscopic surgery was introduced. But this was a check about the surgeons. A fully proficient team usually takes three to six hours during the learning curve, and teams took as much as three times longer for their early cases, the early stage of the learning curve. What is most interesting was that the researchers found remarkable differences in the speed with which different teams learn this. For these training programs, all teams came from very formidable institutes with a lot of experience in technology, technology techniques, adapting new innovations, all that. They have a lot of experience in these big institutes in the United States. And they all had three-day training session at the beginning. Yet, during the performance of last 50 cases, the first 50 cases, some teams managed to half the operating time. Towards the end of 50th case, they have, they have reduced it, so they are operating properly. While others failed to do at all. They didn't improve at all. It therefore appeared that practice, although we say practice makes perfect, this particular study showed that the practice does not necessarily make perfect. When it did, researchers found that it depends on how different surgeons practiced. This is the interesting point. There was one physician in the Harvard group. Although this is an engineering group, there was a physician involved in the testing group, the, 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 the research group. So he made several visits to observe the fastest learning teams and one of the slowest learning teams to see what is going on. Because he being a physician, he can pick up a lot of things unlike an engineer. he was really startled by the contrast between the two groups, two teams. Surgeon on the fastest learning team was actually a quite inexperienced guy compared with the one in the slowest learning team. However, he has picked a team with whom he has worked well before, kept the same team together for the first 15 cases and did not take any new members to the team. He had the team to go through a dry run before the first case and deliberately schedule the first six cases in the first week itself. Today one, tomorrow one, day after tomorrow one. But same team. He convened the team before each case, discussed in detail, and debriefed at the end of each case also, on each day. And research that this particular physician noticed, noted, noticed that this particular surgeon as a person, what they say is, not the Napoleon with the knife in his hand type. 
You know, he was a team man. He was a team person. He used to listen to the others. He used to partner with everyone, with the rest of the team. The other surgeon was a very experienced surgeon, much more experienced than the other guy. He just chose his team randomly, did not keep the team together even for the first three or four cases. There was no briefing and debriefing. Different people were coming every time. And did not track on the ongoing results also. So this particular study offers some valuable information and conclusions used to all of us, not only for surgeons, everyone. This shows that we can do things that can have a dramatic effect on the learning curve by being more cautious on how we train, how we track our progress, and how we enhance our outcomes by attention to detail, irrespective of the nature or the complexity of the procedures we do. So it need not be only in medicine. For our administration, day-to-day -day work, even household works, that has the impact. Also, this study has shown that no matter how accomplished we are, when we try to do something new, we will get worse before we get better. And learning curve put long and affected by a far more complicated range of factors than what anyone has ever realized. So performing safely during the learning curve continues to remain a challenge. Therefore, to fulfill the expectations of the patients we serve, when making this balanced decision which has implications on their lives, it is paramount that it is paramount that we reflect on all relevant aspects most carefully by sticking to basics. Use checklist to be focused and attentive at all times when making decisions before, during, and after surgery, and when handling complications. Always work as teams. Respect the opinions of the other members in the team, including everyone. Share all the information as clearly and explicitly as possible with all the stakeholders, especially the patient and the family, and, uh, 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 and finally learning and to learn to do one thing at a time. We can teach people. We can allow them to do. Whether they do it properly or not is very difficult to say when it comes to certain skills. Now these skills can be not only technical skills. There are a lot of other skills, decision-making skills. So when you transmit information and skills, and then there must be a follow-up. This is the story of this. So ladies and gentlemen, Medicine has evolved, and today, patient safety overrides all other concerns. In everything we do, it is a final physical and emotional outcome that matters. You can operate on a patient. Patient gets better, goes home, and scores the hospital and the surgeon and the entire team. Physical healing has occurred, but emotional healing has not. So it's very, very important as medical profession, we must always think that we must heal the patients physically and emotionally, not only the patient, everyone around them. That is a challenge to the medical profession. What are other skills? Decision-making skills. So when you transmit information and skills, and then there must be a follow-up. This is the story of this. So, ladies and gentlemen, medicine has evolved. And today, patient safety overrides all other concerns. In everything we do, it is a final physical and emotional outcome that matters. You can operate on a patient. Patient gets better, goes home, and scores the hospital and the 
surgeon and the entire team. Physical healing has occurred, but emotional healing has not. So it's very, very important as medical profession, we must always think that we must heal the patients physically and emotionally, not only the patient, everyone around them. That is a challenge to the medical profession. Because what matters is the final outcome. The fact, as doctors, we must never, ever display inaptitude. Self-criticism is very important for us. So my friend, Dr. Milo Ganesh Ratnam, during his long career, to face many such challenges, much more than most of us, definitely much more than me, because I was working in different environments, and saved, <coughs> served this community to the best of his ability, saving thousands of lives. May his soul attain moksha. Thank you.